here I'll talk a little bit about the different directional terms. So in people, posterior is the back, anterior is the front, um, because we're upright and not on all fours. Um, I don't know why, but my brain just has the hardest time keeping these differentiated, so I don't tend to use them even when I'm talking about people. Um, but those are the correct terms for humans. So what we're talking about here is part of what's called the axial skeleton. So um, the vertebral column combined with the skull, the rib cage, and then your hyoid apparatus in your throat um, are, are part of this skeleton called the axial skeleton. They're the structures in your body that protect your head, your neck, and your trunk, um, as opposed to the appendicular um, skeleton, which refers to your appendages, which are um, your arms and legs and also includes the clavicle and the hip bones. Those are the skeletal elements that help you move around. Um, and axial refers to axis, so like the central line of something. Um, and while I have these images up, I'm not going to talk about names of ligaments because there's a billion of them, but I did want to point out on these images that these bones um, are super attached to each other, even without involving um, muscles and, and tendons or anything. So there are ligaments that run down the transverse processes on the side. There's ligaments that run all the way down the spinous processes. Um, there's a big sheet ligament that runs um, on the outside of the bodies of the vertebra. There's also a big sheet that runs on the inside along the spinal cord, um, along the bodies of the vertebra. So these are, are super, super attached to each other um, before you even start talking about like um, tendons and muscles or anything, um, which makes sense because they have to support a lot, but they have to work together to provide that support. So um, we're going to primarily talk about um, three species, the first of which is um, a canid, Canis latrans, which is the coyote. Um, when you're learning veterinary anatomy, you start with the dog, and then um, typically you expand to the horse and the cow. So I'm going to work with those today. Um, this is the full vertebral column of a coyote. It's obviously not how it would look in life. Um, but that's it, tip to tail. And then these are a couple of examples of, um, of individual vertebrae in there. I'm going to use those to um, talk about some of the important structures, the first of which is the spine or the spinous process. Um, this is one that I think is kind of universal when you think about vertebra. Um, it's primarily a muscle, a, a muscle attachment um, structure. The articular processes, each um, vertebra has four of them. So there's going to be two at the front that connect to the, um, the vertebra in front, and there's two in the back that connect to the vertebra in back. Um, they're a little bit harder to see on the thoracic vertebrae, but you can see how wide and flat it is. So the vertebra in front of this one is going to have um, a similarly shaped um, process that's going to come in really closely articulate with that one. Um, and then there's a vertebral foramen, which is the big hole in the middle. Um, and um, this is where the, the spinal cord runs in all of its associated structures. And when it's all together, like it is up here, it's called the vertebral canal. Um, the body of the vertebra, and it's going to be in between the individual bodies that you um, find what are commonly called discs, vertebral discs. Um, the soft tissue, the connective tissue that holds the bodies together. Um, and they don't, they don't allow for a lot of flexibility, but they do allow for a little bit um, of flexibility between the two bones, but also a, a really strong connection between them. Um, and then the transverse processes, which you don't see as much on the thoracic vertebra, this one over here, but um, definitely on the neck vertebra. And these, similar to the spinous process, um, are going to be where muscles kind of attach and run. Um, there are big long strap muscles that run up and down the neck and the spine, and there's going to be one muscle belly that will run kind of above and one that will run below the transverse processes. So those are the basics. Um, we're going to um, now go through each different section. So the neck vertebrae are called the cervical vertebrae. Um, thoracic is your um, chest area. Lumbar is the back, the sacrum and then the caudal vertebrae. And we'll start, oh, that's right. Um, so I wanted to give you guys um, kind of a, like how it would look in the animal perspective before we get too far into it. Um, so obviously a dog and a horse. Um, 
And the biggest thing is that, um, like in people, our neck vertebrae and then our thoracic vertebrae are pretty much in a line. But that's not true for quadrupeds. Um, they're all pretty much going to angle here. And so um, you can kind of see um, these vertebrae are kind of laying funny because they should be tilted up like that. That's how they want to be attached to each other. Um, so yeah, so dog, horse, cow. Um, hello? Okay, sorry. Um, so this is a domestic cow, and I thought it'd be far more fun to look at this kind of cow. Um, <laughs> this is a bison. Um, so these are the specimens that I have um, for an example today. And you can see they're similar. There's obviously pretty big differences between these, these two animals in terms of the spinous process especially. Um, but for the most part, they're pretty much the same. And especially if you look at these first two vertebrae on their neck, they're really pretty similarly shaped. Um, and overall, they're probably pretty similarly sized depending on the breed of domestic cow. All right, so let's talk about cervical vertebrae. Um, I think everybody knows if I asked how many vertebrae are in the neck of a mammal. Seven. Guess what? You're wrong. Not every mammal has seven. Um, the manatee has six. The two-toed sloth has five or six. And those are kind of a result of like um, a couple of them fusing together to provide more stability. But then the three-toed sloth has nine. Nine. I don't get it. Um, so anyway, now you can go to trivia night and blow everybody's minds and also argue with the moderator. Um, so yeah. For the most part, mammals have seven cervical vertebrae, and that is everything from the teeny tiniest little shrew all the way up to giraffes, elephants, all, um, all the way around. Um, cervical vertebrae don't necessarily all look like each other, but one of the defining characteristics um, that you're going to see in them are these transverse foramen, foramina. Um, they're the only type of vertebrae that are going to have these holes, and they're going to run next to or a little bit above the body um, of the vertebra. Um, blood vessels run through these. And so if you're just out in the woods and you find a vertebra and it's got holes in it, you can pretty much, or these foramina in them, you can pretty much be sure it comes from the neck of whatever animal, whatever species it was. Um, so honing in on the first two cervical vertebrae, the atlas and the axis, because um, they're the coolest. Um, the atlas is by far one of my favorite bones anywhere in any species because it's just so wild. It doesn't have a body. It doesn't have a spine. It's got these wings out to the side. Um, it's like, it's just really cool. And like I said, even the teeny tiniest little dudes, like we'll be working on mice and shrews in the lab and their, their atlas looks like this. It's just like this big or even smaller. Um, so. It's it just, I love it. Um, so the one of the big um, structures to be aware of is the dens. So I guess I should say this is the atlas. This is the axis. Um, the axis, or yeah, the axis is going to have this pro, uh, process on it called the dens that um, when it's articulated with the axis kind of sticks through. Um, and it's going to look a little bit differently, different depending on the species, but all axes are going to have a den sticking out the front. Um, and what else was I going to say about this? Oh, um, so this is the, the cranial part of the atlas. This is what attaches to the back of the skull, to the condyles on the occipital bone. Um, this is the joint that lets you do this, OK? This articulates to this, like this. This is the joint that lets you do this, all right? So the yes, no, or the, the yes joint, the no joint. And part of how you can remember the order is at LIS, the T comes before X in the alphabet. So yes joint, no joint, at LIS axis. They're really cool. Um, OK, I wanted, so this so you can see how the dens kind of comes through um, the atlas towards the front. And just for comparison's sake, again, this is the human atlas and axis. Um, <coughs> human atlases are really boring. <laughs> There's nothing like that's got this teeny little 
wing and it's really skinny and it's and it makes sense right because our skulls are sitting right on top of our necks they need to just be really flat they don't really need to do a ton of supporting they just need to be able to do this and you know keep everything together um, and then you can see the dens on the axis and the axis still has the the spinous process but it's not going to be um, nearly as long as the um, as the coyotes is and again this is because this animal needs to be able to support its head out away from its trunk. And that animal is holding its head directly above its trunk. OK, so on the zebra, um, it's pretty similar to, and I have all these bones here, by the way. They're, they're down here on this cart. So if you want to get a closer look at them, um, you guys can come up after. Um, the zebra is going to be pretty similar um, looking to the, um, to the coyote, with the exception of the dens. Um, a lot of these larger quadrupeds are going to have this more kind of cup-shaped, wider dens um, that doesn't go nearly as far into the axis, but it's going to provide more stability um, in that joint by just being wider and, and thicker. Uh, and the same is true for the bison, um, although the axis itself is a lot shorter relatively um, to the compared to the axis or to the atlas. Sorry. Um, and that's, again, part just the, the size of the skull that this animal needs to hold. It needs really stocky bones to help support that. Um, and then the really cool one that I wanted to share is the giraffe. Um, so make sure I'm not going to turn that off. So this is the um, atlas axis. Um, it's got the similar really big cup shape um, to the bison. And it's got this huge, flat, articular surface, um, similar to the bison as well. But the axis, the Atlas, sorry, um, looks really different. It's elongated, um, and it doesn't really have the wings as far out to the side. Um, and it's similar, because um, if you can picture a giraffe holding its head up like this, it's not holding its head out away from its trunk. It's got to hold it up. So the atlas doesn't necessarily need that wide wing to support it. It really needs that length and, and just the sturdiness to help support the head. Um, and then here's a different view of it from the side. So these are really cool bones. <laughs> all right, moving down, um, thoracic vertebrae. Um, and I've got, for all the rest of them, I'll have the, the formula up here. Um, so you can see how many each species relatively has. Not relatively. These are pretty firm numbers. I shouldn't say it that way. Um, <laughs> but you can see comparatively um, what different groups of species have. Um, and I put canine in there, but really, um, most carnivores follow the same formula. So cats, dogs, and the solids um, are going to have the same ver vertebral formula. So um, one of the biggest differences is um, they don't really have the, the processes coming off the side, and that's because these bones primarily need to support the ribs. So they've got these little indentations, these facets. Um, they're called costal facets for the ribs to attach. Um, and they run all the way down. You can see there's a little indentation, and the rib, the head of the rib is going to fit right there in, be, in between the bodies of each, not in between, but against um, both bodies of each vertebra. Um, and then up on these processes, they're going to have what are called tran um, transverse costal facets. So um, each rib has a head, and then they also have um, another process above it called a tubercle that um, attaches at a second point up here on the vertebrae. And that's going to, again, lend support to the rib, but also allow for a little bit more flexibility as the, that rib needs to move when you inhale and exhale. Um, so there's transverse costal facets along the entirety of it as well. Um, and then I wanted to talk about, this is a fun vocabulary term, anticlinal vertebra. Um, this is mostly going to be used in the clinical setting in, veter in veterinary medicine. I'm not sure how much human Med, um, human doctors actually use this term, but it's the most vertically oriented um, spinous process in the thoracic vertebra. It's not the last one, it's just the one that's most vertically oriented. And you can see um, in the canine, um, it's number 11, um, and it's, it's sticking up pretty straight compared to the one in front of it. Um, this is something that they use um, as an orientation mechanism. So if you're doing imaging, or if you are um, palpating, you can look for that, and you'll 
um, kind of be able to tell where you are and then where something else that's going on on that animal's body might be relative to it. Um, here are the other taxa. Um, the bison obviously has these absolutely massive spinous processes. Um, the zebra less so, but still pretty tall. Um, and again, I've got these bones down here. You can come check them out. Um, and then I wanted to kind of show relative um, to what they look like in vivo. Um, so yeah, you can really see where, um, you know, you get an idea of the humps on, on the bison. So there's actually bone in there and then they're layered up with muscle and fat um, to make those big giant humps on their backs. All right, lumbar vertebrae. So again, um, carnivores are gonna have about seven, or gonna have seven. Um, most other uh, quadrupeds are gonna have six. Humans have five most of the time. There's about 10% of the human population that have six of them. Hi, I'm one. Um, I found that out in a rather unfortunate way though. The part of the reason why um, it's important to know how many are there are if you're doing something like an epidural, for example. Um, the anesthesiologist will count the spines of your lumbar vertebrae. If they don't know that you have six of them, it doesn't turn out well. <laughs> Just saying. Um, so yeah, about 10% of humans have an extra one. Um, and I tried to find, I've, I've heard anecdotally that it's some higher percentage of people over a certain height. I'm 6'4", so um, the way that, when I was given this information, the way that, that the doctor told me kind of made it seem like, oh yeah, I'm not surprised you're so tall. Like, it happens all the time in tall people, but I couldn't chase down that, um, like what that actual statistic is. So anyway, um, but you can see, uh, the transverse processes in these are gonna be a little bit different. Um, these are kind of on their own in your back. They don't have ribs or other structures to help support them. So the transverse processes are gonna be a little bit longer um, and really working to support muscle in that area of the body. Um, and you can also, you can also see um, how the articulating, um, the articular processes um, interdigitate a lot more firmly as well here than they did in the thoracic vertebrae. Um, again, to just kind of help support that area. This is the bison. Um, so this is still the coyote. This is the bison. Um, this is missing one, but it's all still articulated in the collection. It just stuck together um, after prepping. Um, and you can see just how wide the articular processes go, um, which makes um, a lot of sense in an animal this size because it's got a whole lot of mass to be moving around. And it's not like the coyote um, is gonna be doing a lot more running, curling up. Um, it's gonna have a lot more flexibility in its lifestyle. This um, animal just needs its back to be really, um, really solid and supportive. So the transverse processes are just gonna be really wide and thick and um, supportive. Um, another, just the, one of the individual coyotes, and then the zebra. Um, and I have to point out, I'm gonna tell on myself, this is again why directional terms are important. Because even somebody that does anatomy that studies it for fun um, will get it wrong. When I was photographing this, um, I had it turned around backwards. So this is actually the caudal end against what I told you guys. This, this is supposed to be cranial for the purposes of this presentation. This is caudal, this is cranial and even I got it backwards. Um, so, and then this is the cranial aspect of it. Um, and this is actually a, a special articulating surface that a lot of horses will have um, right up against their sacrum, the, the end of their um, vertebral column. They've got just a, a whole extra um, set of articulation surfaces for it. So anyway, um, but you can still, like, the important part is the wideness of the wings and. They've got um, pretty prominent uh, spinous processes and that's all for muscle. All right, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Down at the end, um, we have this funny structure called the sacrum, um, which looks really huge in these pictures, but it's this. 
<laughs> um, and so this is um, in dogs, three, in cows and horses, five, um, vertebrae that have actually been fused together. And you can still see the spinous processes um, and the foramina and, and stuff. Um, and they sit in between the wings of the hips. Um, the, the hips are gonna attach right here um, on either side. And um, it's gonna help support that girdle at the, at the back end for the legs. Um, it's also where the spinal cord is going to end. Um, it tapers off toward, it's a, depending on the species, um, either in the end of the lumbar vertebrae or in the sacrum itself. Um, it tapers off and then becomes um, what's called the cauda equina. So the spinal cord itself comes to kind of a pointy end and then a bunch of nerve roots come out of it um, individually. And so it looks kind of like a horse's tail. So they named it cauda tail equina horse. Um, and then out of that comes um, a little cord that's called the felum terminale. Um, and see, this vocabulary stuff is one of the things I really love about anatomy, but I know it's not for everybody, so I'm trying to keep it <laughs> to a minimum. But the felum terminale is actually um, derived from the pia mater, so the, the closest um, supportive uh, connective tissue sheath that's right around the spinal cord itself. Um, and it's gonna come out, come all the way through that cauda equina structure and um, anchor down in the caudal vertebrae on the other end of the sacrum, and that's the end of the, the spinal cord. So it actually does have um, like a little anchor down at the bottom. Um, so yeah, so um, the sacrum, and then at the other end of the sacrum, the, caud the caudal um, vertebral vertebra start. Um, and you can kind of see these first few look like a, a lot of the others. Um, they've still got a vertebral canal and that kind of thing, but then they just become little cylinders of bone. Um, and the, there's still going to be um, ligaments and maybe a little bit of muscle and stuff. Um, but by the time you get down to the end of the tail, it's really just ligaments that are um, holding it together. So the animal can still move their tail, but there's not going to be, um, there's certainly not spinal cord down there. There's not going to be very much muscle. So yeah. I feel like I'm missing something, but I think that's everything. Um, and then this is what it looks like articulated with the um, with the hip bones. Um, these are called the iliac crests. So this joint is called the sacroiliac joint, sacroiliac. Um, but again, the, the hips are going to be part of that other skeletal structure. Um, these are these other taxa, the zebra and the bison. Um, Couple things I wanted to point out um, in all in all bovids, instead of there being like you can really see these individual um, spinous processes, theirs are all fused into one, um, and it's called the median crest, so middle crest, um, and that probably just adds a little bit more stability um, for the hips of these creatures. <coughs> Excuse me for muscle attachment and stuff, um, and. I've got an illustration of it in a little bit, but um, this is all the um, articulating surface for the hip. And in um, horses, it's just this little bit because horse hips are really weirdly shaped. Um, but yeah. All right, comparative anatomy, one more little bit. Um, so here you can really see the, um, the horses have this really kind of thin, wing on their hips, and this is where it's going to attach to the sacrum versus the dog that's um, this wider area. Um, and then you can really see the difference in the human. So our sacrum is relatively large compared to these other animals, and it's because our hips are oriented um, really differently <laughs> than, than a quadruped's. Um, and the, the wings of the ilium are, are um, out to the side instead of uh, forward facing. Um, but the other thing you can see in this illustration is um, the lumbar, the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae um, and how they really need to be wide for this creature. Um, they don't need to be wide for us because we, our um, hips are so close to our 
um, ribs that there's not a ton of open space that the back needs help supporting. Um, and then they're relatively long in the dog, but again, this creature is going to be moving, um, it's going to be engaging in a lot more flexible movement than the horse is, so um, it doesn't need those transverse processes to be so long um, side to side that it can't, um, it can't move the way it wants to. And that is it. Um, <laughs> so uh, these are the three books that I really use specifically for this um, presentation. But um, these two, um, Evan's Guide to the Dissection of the Dog and Anatomy um, of Domestic Animals are two that I've had since um, I was in school and I still rely on them pretty regularly when I'm studying. I have them down here if you want to look at them. Um, and this Animal Anatomy for Artists is something that's going to join my library very soon. Um, they're really, really cool books. So. Um, they're a little bit spendy because they're more on the textbook end of the spectrum, but if you're interested in anatomy, they're really fun. So, thank you. If time anybody for has any questions, I'm happy. There's a few, a little bit of time for questions. I've always wanted to do that, thank you. Um, so in the bison, the, the bits of the vertebra that we can feel, those are the processes, right? That are the, sticking out. The sticky outy mm -hmm. bits, okay. Um, in the bison, over their, for their hump, they're like tall and they're individual friends and then the, together they make the hump. Mm -hmm. Do camels have two of those or do they have a straighter spine and the humps are not related to their spinal column? Correct, the second one. Um, cool. So they do have, let me get back to that. Do, 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 do. That one. Um, they do have this, you know, little um, bit. I haven't, that's a really good question. Should, oh, it, but it's in this book. I can look it up. Um, <laughs> um, they, they do have those spinous processes on their um, thoracic spine, but the humps are actually fully um, soft tissue. So it's going to be um, primarily adipose or fat tissue, um, and then um, other just like connective tissue. It's all soft. So you'll see um, in some captive animals that aren't, that their nutrition isn't being addressed very well, the humps will actually fall over. Um, and that can be a sign that they're just not getting, the, the joke that the keepers make is that they're not getting enough water to fill up the hump. But um, the, it, can, it can be a sign that they're actually not getting enough um, of the right nutrition to keep that, that fat reserve up where it should be. Other questions? <laughs> Do you see with the, like the caudal vertebrae in dogs in breeds, like a corgi or a pug with a curly tail, do they have different shapes or structure? Um, that's going to be the, the way that the ligaments pull and things like that. So the actual structure of the vertebrae is going to be the same. It's then the soft tissue um, of how the, the ligaments attach and pull and how the tendons attach and pull. But the, the overall structure itself isn't, um, the bony structure itself isn't going to look any different. How large are the vertebrae in the giraffe's neck? Um, here, one oh, second. Oh, you got let me, one there. Let me grab a glove. I can hold them up. So this is the wow. axis. Oh my God. Pardon me. Um, this one, so most of the rest of the vertebrae in the neck are actually um, just a little bit longer and definitely a lot wider. Um, than this is, but it's a pretty good um, representation for a giraffe. Um, and they've got really big articular processes on them. Um, obviously, they are going to do a little bit of extra work keeping that neck <laughs> close together. Um, so, yeah. Wow. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, oh of course. <laughs> <laughs> Of course. <laughs> 
this is a, a, <clears throat> not a question. Fantastic talk. But, you know, together with your uh, um, finding out how different uh, terms from your experience with humans are, uh, a lot of the people in the audience are also uh, paleontology volunteers, and I'm sure they can teach you uh, <clears throat> that they don't say your terms. They use other things like parapophyses and uh, psychopophyses. Psychopophyses, <laughs> yeah. And I would love to know, like, if, if there's, like, a paleoanatomy reference something, because I've looked for those terms, but I think I'm looking in the wrong place, and, but I would, I would love to add that to my nerd knowledge repertoire. <laughs> Send nerd knowledge information to Martha. Any other yes. questions? <laughs> All right, let's thank Martha for a great talk. Thank you.